only virtually, and that we can pull together, that we can really center our minds on Jesus and pray. We have a special prayer today with uh, two of our evangelists and one of our elders uh, that are going to be helping us to uh, sort through this, uh, helping us to cope with the things that we've been going through. But right now, we're going to start with a prayer. Uh, it's really appropriate. It says, why are the nations raging, making our world cold? We'll shout louder than the devil. Lord, make us whole. Let's pray to our Father. Father God, whom we seek Christ, we the cross you killed on us. And from a grave death you destroyed. And now to grace we are in blood, opposing us you know. thing to be praying constantly uh, to remember that and to keep that at our focus of our lives at this point uh, we have Bob Keen with us uh, Kendall Knight and Jordan Massey that are going to come and help us in praying and talking about the things good morning my brothers and sisters I'm uh, standing before an empty auditorium due to the uh, COVID restrictions, but I know that I'm also standing before many of you, hundreds of you right now who are watching this on video uh, live, and then many of you who also be watching this uh, later uh, on uh, replay. Uh, we felt like that the circumstances of this past week, which were truly historic in not a favorable way, uh, dictated that we make a statement um, about some of those things, and that's what I'll be doing along with Kendall and Jordan will be praying. You know, we, we, there's a debate about uh, how much the church, not just our church, but all churches, it's an ongoing debate for thousands of years, really, 
how much the church should address public events. There's uh, you know, an argument that the church should not get involved in civilian affairs, and then there's one that the church would be more of activist. Uh, there's statements like, you know, Jesus uh, turned over the tables, and there's other statements to say, yes, that was in the temple of the Jews, which was the church, and uh, that he didn't do it in the palace of Pilate. Um, there's the issue of, do we get too reactionary or are we clueless? There's always striving to achieve that balance of how we uh, address the church. I think we fall down in, in uh, our ministry as shepherds. We're ultimately shepherds of our brothers and sisters. We're caring for the emotional and uh, spiritual needs of our brothers and sisters. And so it really is, to what degree do the events of the world, are they impacting our brothers and sisters in the church? And that becomes somewhat complicated in a diverse church. It would be easier if we were all of the same stripe, uh, because then we would tend to all be affected in the same way. And in fact, uh, many of the churches, the mega churches that you see nowadays, grew so fast because they followed a principle called the homogenous unit principle which was that we're just gonna reach out to people who are just like us and it's easier to convert them than it is to convert other people. Uh, we did not follow that. We believe the Bible speaks to all nations and we're to convert all nations and we're to be a diverse church. But that makes it more complicated for us. It's not so complicated with this past week, however, because it was so obvious the sins that were on display not only within our country, but they were on display for the entire world. Um, we saw the sins of arrogance and pride. We saw the sins of self-centeredness and selfishness and how that hurts so many people. We saw the sins of falsehoods. We saw the sins of favoritism and disparate treatment between ethnic groups and uh, different backgrounds. We saw a thread of white supremacy throughout this which really is a sin because it, it defies the concept of imago Dei, which is crucial to the Bible, that we're all created in the image of God. We all stand at the foot of the cross and at the throne of God uh, on an equal basis, and that nobody is above anybody else. And we also saw that you know nationalism, being a supportive of your country is one thing, but when that nationalism becomes the kingdom that you believe in more than the kingdom of God, that is a sin. And we saw those things, and the church condemns those things. Those are wrong. They're hurtful. And it hurt our members in a lot of different ways. It hurt our members in different, from, depending upon where you're coming from and your background, it hurts you in different ways. Um, some, it reinforced that uh, you know, you've been treated unfairly in our society, and this was just an example of how that unfairness and that hypocrisy continues. It also reinforced a fear that uh, many see this behavior justified when they didn't see other behavior, riots and stuff justified, but they see this behavior justified. That creates a sense of fear that uh, is real and, and true. Um, some people are hurt because their idealism was shattered. You, you come into uh, things thinking that, you know, we have these, uh, these structures and these, the government and there's the confidence in what we believe and what we do, and your confidence in our country has been broken. Other people are hurt because they fear for the future. I think some of us are so invested politically that there's been a transition in power, and some of us are in fear of that, and you hurt for that. All of those things, you know, in, in a diverse church are difficult to meet all those needs. But we, we strive to do that. We strive to hear everybody. We strive to address those. And we strive for all of us to try and understand each other. One of the ways that we can do that and we can heal is if we all lament. I mean, it was so obvious, the sins that were evident this week, and that is the sins of the country, and we need to lament that. We need to lament and we need to pray that God will move in our country and restore civility and restore understanding and restore a real concern and care for the perspectives of other people. It's also a time for self-analysis. You know, we've all been listening to the news. We've all been listening to all this stuff. And depending upon what your preference is, you were affected to some degree by these events. And to some degree, when you hear it all the time, you internalize it. And we need to look and see how much have we brought the mud of the world in on our shoes to the church 
or in our hearts, and we need to repent of that. And that self-reflection is painful and hard, but it is, an, it is essential to us being united as a brotherhood. I think another thing is we need to engage in more deep fellowship about these issues in a way that is understanding and listens to other people and how they feel in genuine, genuine real dialogue and prayer together for unity and compassion for one another. We're called to become the light of the world. Jesus didn't tell us to do that by going out and fighting in the world. He called us to be the light of the world, and that is up, upward call. And so within the church, we're calling everybody to keep that in mind. We're to be the light of the world. We're to be the example of how to handle these kinds of issues in our fellowship. And we've seen that happening over the past few years. A couple of years ago, we would not be talking about these things in the church. You know, we started the Carrying One Another's Burdens program, and it's had a phenomenal impact on our ability to talk about difficult issues of race and ethnicity and how it affects us in our fellowship. And then that's now, uh, we're affected, and many churches are asking us to help. And we've seen even in one church that we've worked with that uh, they had a tremendous change in their fellowship. And then another church that's not a part of our fellowship of churches but has similar doctrinal backgrounds now is meeting with that church because they've seen something that really has been appealing to them as the light of the world. So as we do that, as brothers and sisters, we can be a force to be reckoned with in the darkness. The light can overcome the darkness. And now Kendall's going to talk a little bit more about that. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Bob, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate your heart and uh, the shepherd that you are for the fellowship here at North River. Um, again, the events on Wednesday were appalling. Uh, they were uh, just amazing to see uh, those events transpire. And um, uh, one of the reasons we're here today is I sent an email to the leadership group and said, how should we handle? And I know at that point I needed to be administered to myself. Uh, essentially, my entire life flashed before my eyes. And here's what I mean. When I saw the events happen, and I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of a lineage here and how I processed the events. The first thing I said to myself was, wow, I can't believe that they're trying to control the narrative and they're trying to overthrow something that has already been decided. But then essentially what I thought of was if that were black and brown people climbing on those walls in the Capitol, it frightens me to think of how that situation would have been handled. And I say that because there's a collective trauma that I have as a black and brown person in this country that really solidifies that thought. And it's not a hypothetical thought. It's been proven over and over. In fact, we had our family group got together and we talked about it. Um, we kind of talked about it. We laid out some scriptures and I'll share some of those scriptures that we went through. And to a person, they were just, man, I'm tired. I'm angry. I want to fight. And it was, and, and then we just did a group in Boston in our Carry One Other's Burden series that Bob said, and the same things came up. So it's not just here in Atlanta or with me. It's a series of people that, to a man, almost experienced, experienced the same things. And so when I talk about my life flashing before me, here's what I mean. Is I can remember when we moved down here many years ago, um, we were antagonized by white supremacists. My family were. Uh, there were young men with Confederate flags that would pull up behind our cars and honk their horns and come bumper to bumper with my car and try to intimidate us and literally try to push me out into traffic at a stop sign. They would pull up in front of my house and blow the Dixie horn. Uh, and they, they, they would blow the Dixie horn, intimidating us. In fact, what we had to do is was eventually we wound up calling the police to drive them out. We had to find the landlord of where they were renting from, uh, who they were renting from, and we had to, the neighborhood banded together to drive these guys out. And so when I think of the things like, you know, white supremacy and the Confederate flag, that's real to me. But then the other thought I had as I was watching that, I was thinking, wow, these people are embedded in our communities. And so these people are teachers and lawyers and doctors. And it made me think of the situation in November when my son hit a deer on 316. And as a result of hitting the deer, he decided to call his friends when his car broke down instead of calling the police for help. And it just makes me think of the judges and nurses and those who are in control. And it makes me think of every time I'm called a Yankee because I'm from the North, it really impacts me. 
And so I was going through all this and going through this process, and then I jumped on social media. And I just, you know, I don't respond to social media, but I started looking at other brothers and sisters who were part of our fellowship commenting about, man, are we ever going to talk about racism? Are we ever going to talk about these things in the church? Because to me, I truly believe that some level of nationalism and, and or white supremacy can and will infiltrate the church if we don't stamp it out as brothers and sisters. And so I was still struggling emotionally, and then eventually one of the brothers emailed some scriptures. And I thought, I don't want to hear any scriptures. I mean, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired of all the stuff that's going on here with the Confederate flag, with a gallow, with a noose on the Capitol grounds. I thought, man, what is going on here? And then so finally, our brother John Haynes emailed some scriptures. I said, okay, I've got to get a kingdom focus. I've got to work through my emotional and spiritual PTSD, and I've got to get spiritual focus. I've got to get kingdom focus. And so we, one of the scriptures that I thought of was Luke 23. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And I thought of Proverbs 4, 23. Guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. And as Bob shared, we're not condemning our white brothers and sisters or brothers and sisters from any culture. That's not what we're condemning. We're condemning the sin of racism and white supremacy and nationalism. All nationalism is bad. And so I had to work my way through that. And then we got 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. They have power to demolish strongholds and everything that holds itself. I'm like, oh, okay. And so that was one of the scriptures we talked about in our family group, and it made a difference. And then finally, we kind of got around to this scripture that I really, really hold dear to my heart is in Ephesians chapter 2. When it talks about the dividing wall of hostility, how Jesus came to bring peace to this world and that we must be reconciled to him through the blood of Christ. And that Jew-Gentile issue that they had in the first century church does exist in our churches, but we have a solution. And the brother brought me back to Michael Burns, hey, escaping the beast. And Michael Burns preempted some of this stuff and how the beast, can we can run away with this beast and how we feed this beast. And it really helped me to kind of get grounded in the scriptures. So I do want to share that perspective because I think it's important that we look at hypocrisy and we look at double standards and we look at things in the world and it's not compartmentalized. It is a part of who we are. But I do believe that through the power of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the blood of Christ, and the love we have for one another that we can stamp out this beast. We need to continue to pray for those that have been impacted, for the Capitol officer that lost his life, for the husband that lost his, wa his wife, who was right here from Kennesaw, Georgia, she was there, embedded in our community. We need to pray for those people. And at this time, our dear brother Jordan Mass is going to come up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we lament to you. This has been such a, a terrible week, and we're coming off of 2020, and so many of us were hoping that 2021 would start so differently, and yet more than ever before, we realize that sin and Satan wants to wreck this world no matter what the year. So we, we lament, God, over the sin of this world. We lament when it's so clear what Satan's trying to bring that he's trying to bring and so hate into this world, that Satan's trying to bring and so uh, divisions and factions and, and is to split people apart. Uh, he, he wants to ruin our relationships for love to be removed. He wants us to put our allegiance in other things besides you. Satan doesn't want you to be supreme. He wants an ethnic group to be supreme. He wants anything and everything to tear us away. God, we lament what happened this week. We mourn the sin of this world. And God, I, we know that what you teach us in Scripture. And, and Kendall mentioned it, Father, in Ephesians 2, of what Jesus already did. Not that what he will do, but what Jesus already did. For he himself is our peace. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier? That he has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. God, you said Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace. And in one body, you said, God, in one body to reconcile both of them to you through the cross, 
by which he put to death their hostility. And he came and preached peace to us who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, God, you say that through him we all have access to you by one spirit. God, we pray, we pray mourning over this world. But God, we also pray that we can unite under the peace of Jesus. That we just won't believe that you've broken down the dividing wall of hostility, but we will live it out in your kingdom and rejoice about how we can be united in your kingdom, how it's impossible in this world, but through you, it is so possible. God, I pray personally and for all of us that it's hard to understand. God, I want to understand. Open up my eyes. Show me how this hurts, how this hurts my family, my friends, my, my brothers and sisters. I want to understand, God, not just intellectually, but from my heart. God, I know so many in the church right now are so tired. They're so tired. And some of us have lived uh, in, in, a, in a world where we're not the dominant culture and we see things like this and we're not just tired of hearing about it, we're tired of living it. Others of us that aren't used to talking about this are, are tired of hearing about it and tired of talking about it because it's uncomfortable. There's so many people that are tired right now, God. God, I pray you comfort the brothers and sisters. Comfort and strengthen in their inner being strengthen them and that you may dwell in their hearts and that they may know how wide and how long and how deep your love is god and father i do pray for the future of north river i pray that you will help unite us and that you will bring us together that we will carry each other's burdens that we will empathize that we will love that we will consider and that above all else we will lift up king jesus and that Jesus will reign supreme in our hearts. And that when people see our congregation that's from you, they will see a diverse church, not because of us, but because of you. And they will see ultimately that it's King Jesus that has brought us together. God, I pray that we can show the love and the light that is you to this world. That we can do it with one another. And that we can do it with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
much. And now we're going to be able to hear our sermon. Very pleased to be able to welcome up Tom Brum. North River, 2021. We're uh, continuing our theme uh, that we started last week, Faithful Together. And, um, you know, this is something that we don't do uh, uh, in isolation, this uh, journey of faith that we're on, that we walk it together. The, uh, the Bible talks about this concept of praying for each other day and night so that we can supply what's lacking in, in each other's faith. I think a lot of you know that my tradition before I speak on, on Sunday mornings, particularly during this uh, pandemic, is to come over on Saturday and, and spend some time here in the auditorium. It's even more empty than it is right now. And I take time and I, uh, I think about all of you. I walk up each aisle and, and down some of the rows. And uh, because, you know, when we're all back together at Austin Ave, I, I sort of know where you sit. And I know where your families, you know, your family groups tend to be. And I walk up those aisles and, and I pray for each one of us uh, because this, this is a journey of faith and we need each other. And so the Bible says to pray for each other day and night so that we can see each other again. And how real is that in these last 10 months? that we can actually see each other and, and come back together again. The circumstances will be such so we can spend time together in person. That's what the passage is referring to in 1 Thessalonians 3.10. And then he says, I pray that we can see each other and supply what is lacking in each other's faith. I wonder this morning, is there anything lacking in your faith? It certainly is in mine, actually in all of ours. And to, to be able to to, to grow in Christ the way that uh, into this fullness of the image of the stature of Christ, we do need each other. We need to be faithful together. And for me personally, it's been about uh, two or three weeks uh, since I've been back in this auditorium and being at least with a handful of brothers and sisters. And I'm pretty excited just to, to be here and, and to see you guys and ladies and spend a little bit of time together but you know i was also super excited you know to find out at the very beginning of the year people being baptized into christ nathan was baptized into christ on january the first and then uh, dominique was baptized and then uh, on tuesday uh, camden was baptized into his christ just a little bit a, a few weeks after his mom was restored and then this joy and this new life of, of just right at the beginning of the year seeing young men and women commit to that journey to be faithful together. And, and, and these, these young men and women, they're young, but historically they're old enough to go to war and to start families and to change the world. And, and, and we're, we're wondering, what kind of example will they see in us to be able to be that wind beneath their wings and we give them roots and we give them wings in, uh, you know, in their life. The, um, this morning, uh, those songs are very meaningful, all of them, but, but uh, I thought about the song we just uh, sang a few moments ago, I lean not on my own understanding. There, there's nothing I can hold on to. Well, how appropriate and how timely. Now, now you've noticed already, and, and, and this is an unusual week in our lives, in our history, and we will comment on some of those things we already have. I'll say a few things, although mainly focused on Scripture here for the next 20 minutes, you know, or so. It's so important to be able to see what we're going through and living through in the light of Scripture. And I'm really hoping you'll have a Bible handy, you'll open it up, and you'll look through some of these passages. But if there ever was a thought, leaning not on our own understanding, there's nothing I can hold on to why wow, that song is so appropriate. We have major trust issues in this world. You're aware of that, right? We have a worldwide pandemic, but some people don't trust the vaccine. People don't trust the vote. Many don't trust their elected officials. They don't trust that their government has their best interest in mind. Many don't trust the police. They don't trust their banks. They don't trust the U.S. currency. They don't trust their online security on their networks. 
They, they don't trust their, their own bodies even or their religion or even their God. Women, thousands of them don't trust men. Some people just decide, I don't trust anybody at all, and that's just fine with me. That's how I'm going to have to live. The Bible, though, really makes it clear, any of us that spend any time in it, that on none of those things, none of those things were ever intended to be something that could be fully trusted or leaned upon or counted on. But we can state, you know, today that God is faithful. And that's where, where we're looking at for our, our next, uh, you know, our next passage. Faithful together, God is faithful. I'm just calling it, you know, part two. God is faithful and God is not unaware of the stuff we're going through individually in our families or in our country or in our world. And we can trust him. That's what we're really trying to zero in on, you know, this month. Jeff last week started us off on Faithful Together Part 1. And the focus there was, uh, when we think about this whole overall term of faithful together, we, we tend to think about, okay, our faithfulness and us, and us working together. And yet Jeff riveted us in our curriculum committees. We talked about it and planned these lessons out months ago. The idea was to focus first on God and his faithfulness, and then we can get to us. And we can have that in kind of inspiration and direction to be faithful, you know, together. And Jeff started out in Genesis chapter 1. I'll be looking at Exodus as a launching point, you know, today. And he, he went to God's creation. That just looking at God's creation can inspire faith and trust and awe in, in, in all of us. The, uh, uh, this morning... I got up and uh, I spent some time with the sunrise this morning, and it was beautiful, and I got to pray and reflect and read the Bible and, and, and just think about a lot of the things we're discussing you today. There were, uh, you know, there were a lot of things I, I wondered about. Honestly, I, I wondered how, uh, how my hip was going to feel this morning because I had hip replacement surgery about six weeks ago. So, you know, you never know. You get up in the morning, how am I going to feel? Okay, hey, feels pretty good. That's nice. I wondered what, what's going to be the latest chaos that we're going to have in our country. It'll be something, won't it? Well, what's the latest natural disaster that's, that's going to come? What, uh, I, I wondered, well, what, what are the real intentions of our, our political leaders? I wonder about uh, a, a lot of different things, you know, in uh, you know, my life. And uh, one thing I never wonder about... <laughs> Is that sun coming up tomorrow morning? It's coming up. You can depend on it. You never have to worry about it because God's faithfulness is written in the heavens. Can I get an amen wherever you are or at least a nod and go, well, that's for sure. Well, we can trust God. We can trust his word, you know, the scriptures. And as Jeff reminded us again, always remember as we study the scriptures, Always remember, the main character in this story and our study is our story is God. He is faithful. And today um, we decided, well, a couple months ago we focused on the book of Exodus. I'm going to do that. I'm going to uh, encourage you to read through your Bible, the book of Exodus, and to be able to look and to note God's faithfulness. I'll highlight a few things today, and then I'll make some applications from the New Testament that, that, that are appropriate and timely for us today a little bit later on in, uh, you know, you know, in the lesson. I, I thought about one of the best ways to, to summarize this is from Psalms one, uh, you know, uh, 136. Because here he's reviewing God's faithfulness with Israel in... Uh, uh, as, as he, he showed that his love endures forever. This is a beautiful thing to focus on, to meditate on. God's love endures forever. His faithfulness endures forever. We can trust him. We can put our full weight in him, whatever our present circumstances are. And they change radically. You know, in the, the Bible, as we read about God working with his people, New and Old Testament. But here we see that God's love endures forever, and he uses the events in the book of Exodus as an example. How he, uh, God was faithful 
and his love endures forever. He struck down the firstborn, you know, of Egypt to be able to get their attention and so his people could be set free. He brought Israel out from among them because his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he parted the Red Sea and his love endures forever. He brought Israel out of the midst of it. He swept Pharaoh and the armies into the depths of that sea. His love endures forever. He was an inheritance to his servant, you know, Israel. And we go on through the rest of the, the, rest of the, the, the chapter, and the whole idea is God's love and faithfulness endures forever. Read through the book of Exodus. Be able to see it. You can trust him. You can put your full weight on him, not because of what you're feeling this morning or what's going on around you or what people are doing around you, but God is faithful. We can trust him, lean on him, and depend on him. When you read through Exodus again, you'll just be able to see all of these ways that God showed his faithfulness and his enduring love to his people. How from a childless, older couple, God fulfills his promise and makes Israel this great nation. It's amazing how he protected the little baby Moses in that little mini ark and protected his life. And he had a plan for him, a plan for him. It was so amazing. This little baby is going to be the savior of his people. And God protected him and he, he reared him up in a powerful way. We saw how God was faithful even when Moses was being a little faithless and not really wanting to move on with the assignment that God had proposed in his life. And yet God was patient and loving and he helped Moses work work through those things. We see God's true judgment on Egypt's gods, and their sun god was not reliable, but the, the, the God of Israel really was. He set his people free, just as he promised that he would. He provided manna, water, fire at night, cloud by day, his presence in the desert. He guided them through. He was faithful. He did not leave, even when they were just being idiots, and they were just just causing all kind of issues, and we'll see that in the next psalm. He gave them the Ten Commandments to be able to give them a direction for their living and to try to help build a life that can last. He made that provision, a place for them to live and to be able to grow. And for, through his promise, he led them into the promised land. He stuck with them even through so much disobedience. The focus in this book of Exodus is this promised land that God is leading us somewhere. We're not there yet. We're going through stuff. But God is faithful. He'll take us there. He'll lead us there. There is an issue. There is a problem with humankind. Our problem is that we get, un, that we get faithless like Israel was in their experience with God after these events, but God remains faithful. And again, this is a psalm where you can read through in Psalm 106, and you can see that God's love endures forever, even, even that we have sinned as our ancestors have done. Uh, they acted disobediently. They, they gave no thought to your miracles. They didn't remember your, your many kindnesses. And then in verse 13, here's this phrase. They soon forgot what he had done, and they didn't wait for his plan to unfold. This is an issue with all men and women who want to be faithful to God and to be committed, and they go, okay, I've made that decision. As time goes on, we will forget some of the things God has done, even in our own life, much less throughout history. And then we will not wait for his plan to unfold. I think it's a major problem for so many through so many years, not willing to wait for the plan to unfold in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our world. My six decades of life have taught me, well, you just got to wait for some things for God to be able, in his timing, to be able to move. I'm not great at patience. Kelly points it out all the time. I think she, she thinks traffic is my worst problem. I think technology also is right up there. And we'll be at the traffic light, and I want to check my phone. Okay, but she says, you can't touch your phone or they're going to throw you in jail for the rest of your life. Okay, and we have this little debate. I don't think that's going to be the case, but you know, she said, no, 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 you cannot touch your phone. I want to look at that phone. I'm impatient in traffic. I'm impatient in, 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 even in little things like that, but that's a small gig. But all of us have problems and, and, and things with this. This is a very interesting week for me. I, uh, I had a very interesting 24 hours. And uh, on Tuesday, 
I was, I was just rejoicing over the baptisms. I was getting to see the pictures and getting the word that um, Camden was going to be baptized that night. And our youth and family, uh, brothers and sisters, were so excited. And, um, and, and I got home and I looked at the mail. And uh, I, had a, I, had a, I had a check that looked like it was from the government. I opened it up. And it was $1,200 that I completely did not expect. And I went, wow, that's a good day. And I, I showed Kelly and said, well, what are we going to do with this? We, it's unexpected. We were planning on this money. What, what should we do with it? And we, and, and we decided, you know, this, you know, we have our budget together. We're going to go ahead and give half of that to our Generosity Sunday. We'll give that early uh, to our season of giving. And then we're going to take the other half, the other $600, and be able to give to people that we know that are struggling a little bit financially. We've already used about $300 of that. And so that was a good thing. We're pretty excited about it. And then, within 24 hours, it's on Wednesday, I'm trying to drive back, my, my phone is, is blowing up. Now, I can't touch it or Kelly is convinced they're going to throw me in jail for a long time. So I can't look at it, but it's blowing up. Bing, 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 bing. And because of what is going on in our country and going on in, you know, in, in our capital. And it was just, uh, it, it was crazy. I got home. And I, uh, I don't watch news a lot, but when I do, I go back and forth between two sort of different channels with different perspectives. And uh, the one thing I did do, I definitely saw different perspectives, but there was one thing that was clear. Everybody was completely, you know, horrified and feeling like this, this, this is wrong. That we, how did we get here? They have different perspectives on that point, but all that it was wrong, and then it was chaos, and it was whole world is watching, you know, uh, you know, some terrible events, you know, in our country. And, and I thought, you know, there are lessons to be learned in, in 2020. And I, I think one of the lessons that I've learned, I suspect you have too, is that people have different perspectives. They really do. On the same events, on the same things that happen. We've known that for a long time, but this is more than food, entertainment, or our sports teams. You know, 2020 propelled us in a, in a, in a whole nother way to face up with some uncomfortable, you know, things. I saw this, uh, th this article. Um, there's a group called Renew that is some of our restoration churches that tr work to deepen their Bible study. And there's a gentleman named Daniel, uh, Daniel McCoy who wrote this article, A Tragic Choice for a Hill to Die On. And he was, he was lamenting, you know, over this, over the events, you know, that we all went through, you know, in the Capitol. And he, he said, as Americans, we couldn't make it a week after merrily ringing in a new unsoiled year before seeing radicals break windows and scaling walls in our own U.S. Capitol. On Wednesday, January 6th, our stomachs sank as we saw photos of lawn nooses, Confederate flags, barricaded doors, and senators huddled in fear. I wrote down... Uh, you know, when I first heard about these things, I just wrote down in my little journal, this is, this is profoundly sad and troubling. The, uh, it, it, this article goes on. It says, Capitol Hill, for one, more than one protester, became the hill to die on. And he is, he's kind of thinking through his experience in, in different churches. Said, uh, one of the great disappointments of 2020 was seeing Christians die on the wrong hill. Through the years, we've all shaken our heads about hearing stories of churches splitting and dividing for dumb reasons. Can you believe some, some churches actually split over the color of the carpet? I didn't know that, but I'm assuming he's referring to something he's aware of. Crazy, at some of our richly resourced multi-staff churches of 2020 threatened to tear apart over what to do with an even thinner strip of cloth called a mask. Now, you know, what's interesting, he goes on and he says, if there are political differences within your church, then praise God. We should all be praising God right now. Because what he goes on to say, this means you have not circled the wagon so tightly that outsiders don't feel welcome in your church. It's not that, whatever that technical term you use, Bob, you know, about everybody, all the same people getting together, you know. No, it is a, it is a church of all nations, you know. And these, these differences give us a starting point for living out the biblical commands to seek peace and pursue it and to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. 
<laughs> Those scriptures don't even make sense, you know, if everyone you hang out with is somebody you agree with in every detail, you know, and, and, and look exactly the same way. You just got a social club, you know, or a political club rather than a church. And the eradication of differences as we talk about some of these things, some of us will have different perspectives even on what's been said, you know, today. You know, it's, uh, you know, the eradicating that at all, thinking the same way, is not the hill the North River is going to choose to die on. It's allegiance to Jesus Christ and his kingdom and the lordship of Jesus Christ, loving God, loving people, and helping change the world. That's the hill. And uh, we remember Michael Burns on... Uh, you know, he, he taught us there in, um, in December, and his book is very strong on escaping the beast. There is a, base, a beast to escape, and it's not us. It's not somebody who may see things with a different perspective than us. It is the true beast in the Bible. It's the true dark forces that have, among many agendas, a primary agenda of trying to divide people and cause distrust and not, not, not to be... Uh, strong in being faithful with, with God, the, uh, the real enemy. You know, the book of Revelation talks a lot about this. Um, what's interesting is, that, is our New Testament is written. Uh, th there was definitely a world power, and they were all a part of it. It was Rome. Uh, I mean, in talking about a dominant culture, that was the dominant culture of all dominant cultures. They ruled everything. The Bible talked about it in Revelation as a beast. It's, it's referred to Rome in, in symbolic ways several times in this respect. They were all about empire, not about shalom. And it'd be hard for us to imagine what it would be like to live in Egyptian slavery. Well, I think it'd be hard for us to imagine what it was like for the vast majority, not only the Roman Empire, but most of our fellow disciples at that time when the New Testament was written, they were slaves. Up to a half of the Roman Empire at certain times were slaves. It wasn't even seriously questioned in any of the documents, you know, of that day. There's never been, uh, I, I think, any, uh, uh, it, 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 any culture that inundated with it. They actually had a view that it helped provide social balance there. It was, it, it was rough. And this is where our Christians were. I mean, the thought of treating each other fairly and equally in the history of the world, pretty much every culture, every country, every person, by the time they reach middle school, they figured it out. It's abundantly clear. Tragically, this world has never been fair. But in Jesus' church, we're called a higher standard. But, they, you, but, but, but things like race, gender, religion, social strata, education, physical appearance, economic prosperity, people are treated differently and often unjustly and despicably. That unfortunately, is a history of our world. And all of us understand that. But, 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 but so on one hand, we do everything we can to have the spirit. And we're going to see these scriptures in Romans chapter 12 in a minute to have, to, to have that not in any way in the church, but we're humans. We got to keep working, you know, on, you know, on this. But uh, it's, it's a good thing to remember where most of our brothers and sisters were dealing with as they were reading these passages, and I'm gonna, I want to close out and, and ask you to spend some time doing something for me. It's in the book of Romans, in Romans. Now, Romans 1 through 11 is all about God is faithful. But in Romans 12 through 16, it's being faithful together. And if you will read Romans chapter 12 through 15 and spend time thinking about it, reflecting on it, meditating on it, etc., you'll be able to see how Christians, God's instruction to us, how we should, we should be dealing with whatever we're dealing with presently and whatever comes at us in, you know, you know, in the future. I'll highlight these things. I want you to be able to spend time with them, and then we'll wrap it up. Hey, the first thing is offer our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, and do not be conformed to the pattern of the world. So important. And then a, a pattern Message that a lot of us would do well to think a lot about. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather with sober judgment. We got to be very circumspect about the things that we think about and we're so sure about and be humble and willing to be sober minded and understand we are in a body, which is the very next phrase. Each of us, we got many parts, but we're one body and the same way it's that way in the church and we all belong 
to each other. So important. And then this is something I want us to talk about for just a moment before we're done. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. The imperative in the scripture is love. Hate what is evil is a very strong word. And God says in, in, in Proverbs chapter 6, hey, verse 19 there, seven things to hate, and he hates them. None of them are people, though. We hate sin, and there are a lot of things we've already talked about them that were wrong, that were sin. You may have a different perspective on some nuances of it, but clearly these things were wrong and chaos and not only embarrassment, but in some ways a condemnation, you know, of, of, some, of many aspects and that we need to work on this and pray about it. But while we hate evil, we love people. Be devoted to one another in love. Above all else, love one another because love covers what? A multitude of sins, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. The greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13. If you think you got all the wisdom in the world and the greatest speech and the greatest perspective, if you don't have love, you're a zero. You're nothing, according to the Bible. This is so important, but love must be sincere. It's the word we, we use, the English word we use for this is hypocrisy. It's uh, the Greek word for sincerity, we, we, we tr transliterated for sincerity. And it was the word where an actor in the ancient world would put on a mask, and they would play a role. And their love, in this case, he's saying, don't, don't be fake about it. Don't put on a mask. You know, make it real. Make it sincere. Make it based on what God says to be, make it based on that, on, you know, on our opinions about certain kinds of things. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Let's have empathy for each other. Wherever we feel like we are on some of these things, let's take the time to try to validate what each other is feeling. We are one body. We are together. We are one family. And this is not opinion. This is Scripture. And then, of course, he goes on. He says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I certainly hope that that's what we're going to be, you know, be, be, be doing in uh, 2021. Um, we do want to change the world, but we got to love God and love people to be able to do it. Some of you may not like what chapter 13 is going to say, so I'll just leave it with you, see if you got the courage to read it and put it into practice. And in chapter 14, no passing judgment on brothers and sisters in Christ, period. Everything we do to build each other up, and we are strong, if you feel like you're strong, our goal is to bear with the failings of the weak. Um, thank you for your attention to this. I'm a flawed human being. I'm almost positive I've said some things that, you know, aren't exactly perfectly said. All of us are. But God's word is there. <laughs> Jump on in Romans. Jump on in Exodus. Love, be devoted with brotherly love. Be kind, compassion, overcome evil with good. And then it's in, in Psalm 89, <laughs> let's sing and declare the righteousness of God. That's what North River wants to be about in 2021. And um, as we take communion in just a moment, get your bread and your juice, just reflect it. The Bible says we do this until he comes again. And ultimately, <laughs> the only words that ever matter, that we ever hear, are these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. He's faithful. Let's be faithful together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are humbled by your scripture. We're humbled by our own sins and weaknesses. But Father, we're inspired by Jesus. Thank you that he loves sinners enough, like us, to get up on a cross for us. Pray that we can, in the same way, love and serve. Please take this service, but most of all, take these emblems, this, this bread and this, this juice, and work in our hearts to make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
That concludes our communion portion of our service. And now we're going to hear a really encouraging message from Kevin and Noel Broyles. Good morning, North River. It's Kevin and Noel Broyles here, and we're excited to have an opportunity to share with you a few moments about giving and serving and about the contribution today, as well as to introduce you to your new North River Hope Worldwide chapter mm -hmm. and to tell you about one of the first events we're doing, which is the Martin Luther King event this next Sunday. And 2020 was quite the year and uh, one we'll never forget. 2021 is a new year, and Noelle, I know you have a few thoughts you want to share about the one. Mm. You know, um, as we all enter into every new year, we always ask ourselves, you know, who do I want to be? How do I want to live? And 2021, mm. I'm so glad it has the number one in it because it makes me think, how can I, as one person, uh, bring help and healing to this world? And right now, you know, the world really is full of a lot of conflict and confusion mm. and chaos and COVID and crisis and so many things. But it was the same world that Jesus walked mm -hmm. in. And Jesus was never confused about how to help. Indeed, he showed us how one person, Jesus, uh, chose compassion and helped one person and therefore changed mm. the world. A couple of verses that are familiar to us all is I love how Jesus described himself in Luke 22. He says, I'm among you as one person who serves. Mm. And in Matthew 25, he says, whatever you did, whatever you do for one of the least of these, mm -hmm. you did it, you're doing it for me because they're mine. So whatever clothes, whatever food, whatever time that we spend encouraging, we are changing mm. not only our hearts and lives, but helping Amen. to encourage the heart and life of someone else. Amen. I really appreciate that, Noel. And the truth is, is that uh, why we created the North River Hope Worldwide chapter. It's just an ability for us to be able to identify opportunities, to connect with what's being done and to serve with opportunities in addition to the things we've already been doing. I mean, North River is known for its generosity and service. The YES program has been phenomenal. Wow. Many people have been working with the MUST ministries and I can't even, even enumerate all the things that are being done. Right. But the goal of the North River Hope Worldwide chapter will be to join with other chapters across the country and doing things to serve our communities. But we will choose things to serve in addition to what you've been doing, we'll create some new opportunities as well. The, the vision of the North River Hope Worldwide chapter is the same vision of Hope Worldwide, which is that every member will be engaged and every engagement will be transformative. Mm. It'll be an opportunity to be able to not only have an experience that's meaningful for the person you're serving, but for yourself. And so we'll be joining with the YES program and with other programs we've been doing in order to be able to, to do some significant things in our community. One of the things you'll have the opportunity to do in the very near future will be to join the Volunteer Hub. And the Volunteer Hub will be the opportunity to sign up to be a member of the North River Hope Worldwide chapter, but you'll also be able to see all of the opportunities to serve on that hub and you'll be able to sign up for those opportunities. So coming soon to you very soon will be a link that you can go to, to sign up for the volunteer hub. And I wanna give Noel a moment to just share about the Martin Luther King event this next weekend. How great that we get to be together to serve in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during January right now. So, you know, the COVID uh, situation has strained and drained mm. the resources of so many of the community programs surrounding us. And there's a huge need for specific items, specific food items, toiletries, socks, underwear, and encouragement cards for children who mm. are hurting. And so throughout this week, we hope to gather these all of these items. And on Sunday, next Sunday, January 17th, from one to three o'clock, um, we hope to gather all of these donations in the church parking lot, and then we will distribute them to the different community programs this coming week. So please check the newsletter, check the bulletin, and, um, and please yeah. join with us because together 
we make one great Jesus. Yeah, please check the website and check our North River uh, newsletter as well. And you'll see all of the specific things that these groups that we've been working with that are right here in this slide uh, need and have said that they need. And, uh, and in closing, I just, as I think about our giving, you know, I, I think about what Paul had said and shared with the Thessalonians. He said, about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And in fact, you do love all of God's family. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. You, North River, has been known for its giving, generosity, and love for the community. And as we go into 2021 and we have opportunities to give, let us continue to give generously as we have in the past because God has faithfully enabled us to have the things we need to faithfully be able to give to others. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of an incredible family. Thank you, Father, for faithfully giving to us the things we need that will enable us to be your children as we go into our communities and we love and we give and, I, and serve. And as we give our contribution today, Father, we know that we give this to support the great work, but also, Father, help us to give of ourselves throughout the week with love and generosity and kindness to each and every person we see and to be able to see the one. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. 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 What an encouraging thing just to see an amazing opportunity to be able to give to our fellow human being uh, through Hope Worldwide, through the donations that Kevin Noel talked about. I really want to thank Tom for your amazing message, just reminding us that God is faithful and that we need to be faithful together. We're going to sing a song that talks about that, that we're going to sing with one voice praises to our great God in heaven. We are part of God's family that is around the world. So let's praise him together, faithful together. We got our brother JK is going to lead this song for us. Thanks for doing that, brother. All right, let's go. Lord, your love has saved us. Sing with one voice, they are shouting, singing hallelujah, 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 praise is heard around the world, into all creation, into all creation, each and every nation, each and every nation, sending your salvation, sending your salvation. Demons fighting against the demons fighting. Holy Spirit guiding. Holy Spirit guiding. And family, we're united. Family, we're united. All around the world. All around the world. So can't you hear them? Hear them singing. The people there rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting. The people there rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting, singing, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise is heard around the world. Can't you hear them? Hear them singing. The people there rejoicing with one voice. They are shouting. Turn around the world.
Love y'all. Have a good day.